Everybody, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. This time we're going to talk about the end of the fifth wave. And if you've been with us for some of these previous broadcasts, you've heard me talk about the fact that we are coming to the end of a technology trend that lasts about 50 years and that the next four or five years are going to see massive changes. And it's time for us to talk about what changes we need to focus upon for those particular times. So here we talk about today, the end of the fifth wave and what that's going to mean for us all. So number one, first of all, thanks to Shelley Palmer, who has given some of these ideas and given us the facts that uh, help us to define today's broadcast. Number one, the big will get bigger, the small will survive, and the middle will perish. This speaks of the kinds of white collar jobs that are going to disappear during this next generation. And we ought to be ready for it and retrain people and make sure that we have the opportunities through technology to be able to give this generation of employees new opportunities because of those technology changes. Number two, consumers will demand on demand. You're going to find the next generation, millennials and Generation Z, not wanting to own cars as much as to have use of cars. And so many of the things that we see today beginning to emerge, Uber and Lyft and others, are going to be very common for us and our future in the next generation. Number three, access is becoming as valuable as ownership. Think in terms of DVDs, CDs, think in terms of automobiles. The next generation is going to want on demand as you saw, and is going to want access to these things without having to worry about owning them. Owning a DVD will look as old as, uh, I guess, owning a 78 record did two, two generations ago. Number four, anything that you can talk to will talk back. Voice control will become the obvious keyboard of the future for the next generation. It has already begun. We're using Alexa we're using Hey Google, we're using all those different kinds of access today as experiments. Tomorrow, they're going to be very obvious, especially when we find ourselves, for instance, using glasses for our way of getting information to us. We'll be talking to the microphone built into the earpiece rather than having to worry about a computer that we carry around with us or a smartphone for that matter. Number five, the audio industry will contract by 20%. All of this as a result of ride sharing. Again, we're speaking of the next generations, not necessarily the people today that think that they must have a car to get around from place to place, especially in spread out places like Los Angeles or cities less dense than New York. Number six, artificial intelligence will start taking white collar jobs more quickly than the experts predict. Think about that one for a minute. We are going to lose jobs, and it's time for us to find to retrain people so that those new jobs are available and fast, much faster than people have been predicting in the future or in the past. Number seven, new tech jobs will not replace all the jobs that technology displaces. In other words, we're going to find new ways of employing people. I think you're finding, you're going to find that healthcare is going to be one of those areas, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about next. But technology doesn't necessarily mean that new tech is going to find a lot of new people to replace all the things that technology is going to displace. Number eight, the conversions of on-demand machine learning and autonomy will change the world. Boy, this is a big one. What we're saying is if machines can learn themselves, if the on-demand economy can ask for all of these machines to be able to help us, for instance, self-driving taxis picking us up, 
and the autonomous ability to do these things for ourselves, boy, this is going to change the world. And it's going to make people much more able to do and to travel and to make things happen than they ever did in the past. Number nine, data in the presence of other data is more powerful. In other words, finding unique things is important, but finding things in relationship to other things is much more important and much more powerful. And large databases will be composed of combinations of other databases from the past. Number 10, anything that can be connected will be connected. <laughs> We've seen this begin to happen already with, again, Alexa, controlling devices like your light and your heat in your home and many other devices that people are finding they can control through Alexa. Number 11, anything that can be hacked will be hacked. We've seen examples already of people hacking automobiles through their MMI system, their multimedia interface systems. And we're going to see much more of that and be afraid of that and find ways of defending against that in our near future. Number 12, distribution channel disruption is accelerating. Think in terms of the travel agent, my favorite example. Travel agents are now becoming specialists, especially in vacation travel, but they certainly aren't the ones that you look to first when you make a reservation for either a new hotel or a trip. 60% of the people today go directly to Google before they begin to do anything, and then they check peer reviews before they make their reservations. That channel in the middle, those travel agents, they're gone. Same thing is true of many retailers and other people who are in the middle between the provider of products and the end user of products. Think in terms of banks. Banks today are the stable financial institutions we trust most. And yet, if blockchain becomes a reality and Bitcoin and other coins become the method in which we communicate and pay, banks aren't necessary in the middle. Number 13. We cannot train enough doctors and dentists and health professionals. Our population is aging, our population is growing, and in the end, we will need more of these professionals in the healthcare industry. Well, that offsets the need for fewer professionals in IT. It's gonna be a real change, a sea change in the kinds of people that we employ. Number 14, fresh water is becoming a scarce resource and we ought to treat it as such. Investing in water may be a very good thing to do over the long run, but it's not the investment I worry about most. It is the fact that the fresh water sources themselves will become more scarce as climate change makes fresh water more difficult to find in areas such as the West Coast, especially. Number 15, confirmation bias will increase because we filter what we see using the internet. Think of the differences now between Congress and the way it behaves today compared to the way it behaved in the past, or even the way we review our news. We filter everything we see through our own biases as we look at sources on the internet, which we trust. And that will continue and accelerate, and not to the benefit of people understanding other people. Number 16, education is just too expensive and not producing qualified candidates for newly created jobs. We need to change the education system, enhance community colleges, give us a chance to find more trade technology training, and to give other liberal arts institutions the chance to train people to do creative thinking and allow those people to be the inventors of the future, the people that worry more about what's going to happen than the people who are actually going to produce. Number 17, I had to include this one, and again, thanks to Shelley Palmer, climate change will cause sea levels to rise over these next 50 years. And this is a 50 year cycle that we're speaking about and something we really ought to be concerned with. Notice my backdrop. <laughs> it is a wave. This is the end of the fifth wave, but we're going to have a sea change during the sixth wave that is going to be something that we need to contend with and understand. Well, that's 17 things that we talked about just already that we can begin to see happen during the next five to seven years, let alone the 50 years to follow. Well, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report. I hope that this made you think about the possibilities that we have to focus upon in the near future. I'm Raghu Bala, CEO of NetObjects. You are watching Ion Business.
Well, hello everybody. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. Today we're going to talk about metrics and a dashboard. Have you ever driven a car without a speedometer? I had that thrill when I was a student at the Richard Petty Stock Car School of Driving at a motor speedway in California. With a wide track angled aggressively at the curves and being able to hug the wall on the straightaways, there was little reference available to a novice driver as to speed. I followed my instructor's car closely, and I couldn't tell much about my speed, so I couldn't compensate for lags behind my leader, nor could I test my comfort zone at various points that matched the expectation of my instructor, or my increasing capabilities as a driver. Well, upon conclusion of eight laps of this, after pulling into the alley and pulling out of the driver's side, you see there are no doors in these cars, I was handled a sheet with the timings for each of the eight laps. And only then, after which the information might have been useful, could I see how well I did. Well, that's how you would feel if you ran your company without a dashboard. Well, it's time for us to figure that one out. What are the things you'd need to make a dashboard that would be relevant for your company? Well, metrics created by you and your managers need to measure near real-time progress for your enterprise. These are things that are deemed critical by you and your managers that you can combine onto a single page or a single screen and be able to look at information that is as fresh as yesterday or yesterday compared to last week or perhaps unit shipped compared to same period last month or perhaps it is something like overtime hours by department. There are lots of measures that you can make that you'll be able to use to operate your business in a much more successful and a much more current manner. Think of the critical things that you use to measure your business that can't be ignored. Things that are needed for you and for others to be able to manage a very good business. What good information contained in a great dashboard would be fine if you ignored it? Well, show that the value of the information that you're acting upon is something that people notice that you do something about. And so show this dashboard to others. Use this dashboard in a regular way and you'll end up driving your revenue in a way in which you will make more money, you'll have employees who will enjoy their business more, and dashboards are the key to a much better business. Well, this is Dave Burkus with the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. See you next time. Mark Babbitt, CEO and founder of U-Turn, and you're watching Facets Television. Hi, my name is Joey Flores, and I'm the co-founder of Earbits.com. You're watching Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television. Welcome to our show tonight. With us today is George Fritas, and he is the CEO of Black Pencil. Black Pencil actually makes a variety of different products, but the product we're going to talk about today is a product called Vestpack. 
Now, for those of you that know me, you know that I'm a gun enthusiast, a Second Amendment rights person, but more importantly, I'm about defending those that cannot defend themselves. I teach everything from self-defense to firearms and other things that help people to stay safe in their community. One of the things that I learned about George is George is a teacher, but George also invented one of the coolest things I've seen in a very long time, and I'm going to let George tell you about it. So, George, thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for Appreciate having me. It. So tell me about Vestpack. What is Vestpack all about? Vestpack is a backpack that uh, I envision to have like an like emergency system for people like me that have no protection or, you know, I don't know martial arts or I don't know how to defend myself. I don't have a gun. So uh, people like me, so basically. So um, something that I can go anywhere and then I can, if I travel, I, I feel more safe and, you know, and then I, if there's any, any kind of situation, I can defend myself. So what is the function of the backpack that makes you safer? Well, it's, uh, we have like, um, it's a system that can wrap around yourself, right? Okay. So you, you protect your back, you protect your, your torso, and mm -hmm. then you, uh, you, you have like, you know, all the, I mean, if you have like any, any situation that you have like bullets from all over the place, you at least have your, mm -hmm. your vital organs protected. So if you can imagine, um, we've had in Sutherland, Texas, we've had a shooting of a church, 26 people died, many more were injured. Yeah. Um, those folks, unfortunate folks in, in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay and, um, you know, 568 people were injured along with 50 plus people were killed. And so having some sort of apparatus that's bulletproof, and this is what caught my attention. In fact, we have one here today so you can get an idea of what it looks like. And basically what it is is it's a backpack with an open side on it that allows you to quickly deploy uh, this front plate if you're wearing it on your back, this goes around the front, and it's a 3A, which means it'll cover most handgun rounds, protected, bulletproof vest. And inside the back of the backpack is an additional plate that does the same. Exactly. So this gentleman, who happens to be a teacher, is ahead of us, all of us that are in the self-defense world, um, and has invented this. So what made you come up with this idea? I mean, where did this come from? I was uh, watching TV in my class, and uh, a couple years ago when I, s I was watching the Sandy Hook massacre, and I saw those, um, I believe it was 28 people, mm -hmm. there were 20, about 20 pe 28 people, and most of them were children. And then I designed, uh, I did like some sketches, got some fra fabrics, and then I submitted for the patent. And um, that was it, like about two years ago. So it, this is a patented product. It is available to currently today, and then of course you're you're formulating a, some sort of a, a growth pattern. And unfortunately, market conditions um, seems yes. like they're going to do well. Um, what was your driver? Is this because you felt um, at risk, or was it about protecting your kids? I mean, what was the point of it for you? The point is, like, for example, as a teacher, uh, it's really easy for you to go to any school nowadays and um, you just go through security. You know, if you see your parent, mm -hmm. they let you go. Um, there was a couple of days also as well in, in uh, North um, California. There was another shooting there, mm -hmm. and, and the guy just went uh, straight to the school. Yeah. And um, it's super easy for you to, if you want to do harm in evil, it's really easy for you to do, uh, you go there and shooting, uh, go in the shooting spree. <laughs> It's really easy. Well, I found so much value in it, and I don't normally talk about products from the perspective of consumption, but this is one of those things where I heard about it through someone else and within an hour asked to order one for myself, and I now carry it as my primary briefcase, which so got my laptop and all my stuff in it. Um, and I, you know, those that know me know I'm not paranoid, but I am aware enough to understand that this could not only save me, but it could give me the opportunity to stay on my feet and save someone else. So that's how I see it. It's not about saving me, but keeping me up on my feet so that I can help to deal with whatever exactly. the situation might be. Um, so what's the business doing for you so far? Where are you in the way of investment? I mean, what's next? Well, uh, I'm looking for also investment. I'm, I'm selling those at the uh, vestpack safecom Okay. We are selling those. And for example, this, this backpack is mine. So I have, for example, I have the emergency system right here mm -hmm. with you no know, first aid. I have like some, uh, some, for example, some accessories that also are sold on the, on the, on the site. For example, okay. like a battery, charger, stuff like that. You have uh, also a solar panel 
-hmm. And uh, those come included with a backpack. So, um, and also this model has the inside out. Has a rigid one, also 3A. So these are all included in this vest pack. So that's what I'm reselling at the, at the site right now. So it's a complete solution, you know. Have an emergency kit, solar panel, battery, and uh, it's a and, nice and, looking pack. And I like it because it's, it's non threatening, it's inconspicuous, it's not, it, you know, no one knows what it is until you convert it into what it's meant to be. So um, that's why I found it to be so interesting. Um, Where's your marketing right now? You're doing mostly your marketing online. What's your future look like? We're marketing exclusively online. Okay. Yeah, for civilians, for basically everyone that needs protection. And do you there. have a licensing plan that you'd like to be licensing to larger manufacturers if possible? Yeah, we're open to that also as well. Okay. We're open to that also as well. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for coming in this evening and showing us your product. And I have to tell you, like I said, I own one. So I find value in what you're doing, and hopefully the rest of the community will as well. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you've been watching Facets Television, and we hope you'll come back soon. Hello, welcome back. I'm Judge Jim Gray, a retired Superior Court judge in Orange County, California, and you are here with me in my judge's chambers. I'd like to talk to you about the minimum wage, because that brings kind of a conundrum. We all see that some people are working for wages that they can't really support their families with. In fact, they can't even pay for apartments, etc. Uh, and those are things that are of concern. We also, on the other hand of the conundrum, see that when we pass all of these programs, all of these laws, the situation situations get worse. So what I would suggest to you is get the government out of this and allow people in the free market to negotiate their employment contracts. Honestly, maybe crassly, I've got to tell you that some people are not worth $10.10 per hour in the marketplace, and if they're not, they'll lose their jobs. Think of it this way as well. It is much healthier for society to have, for example, 100 people working for $10 per hour than 65 people working for $15 an hour. And then if you have problems with regard to people and, their, and not having enough money, according to Dr. Milton Friedman, who's one of a hero of mine, he says that the difference between the poor and the wealthy are that the wealthy have more money. So give the poor some money. Give them a stipend of some form, but do not interfere with the free market and the freedom of contract. It's important for people to get work. It's important for young people to just get their foot in the door and be able to develop a work ethic. And once they learn to show up on time and be, have a good attitude and work well, they'll make more money as time goes along. That's a good thing. But get the government out of the marketplace. The only real good thing that comes from minimum wage laws is it makes legislators feel a lot better about themselves. That's not a particularly healthy situation to be in. So that's what I think from the judges' chambers. Give it some thought, and I think the more you consider it, the more you will agree. Stay tuned. Next time we'll talk about other issues, maybe controversial, maybe not, maybe less controversial once we focus on them here in the judges' chambers. See you then.